Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, I should start by thanking my uh, co-authors, Neil Lawrence, some of you might know Neil, and Magnus Ratfe, who's now moved to the University of Manchester. Uh, I've been working with these guys for a couple of years now, and we're interested in all kinds of models, Bayesian models that we tend to solve variationally. And after a little while, we were looking at these models and thinking, how can we uh, make them bigger to deal with really big bioinformatics data sets? And sort of unpicking all of the variational machinery, and we totally failed at making them bigger at all. But we did manage to make quite a few interesting connections uh, to some of the recent literature. And in particular, we've made the fairly standard VB update procedure go quite a lot faster. That's kind of what I'm going to talk about. There are quite a lot of uh, connecting themes in here, which connect to some ideas which people may or may not be familiar with. And uh, at the end, there's what happens to be a really tiny tweak that gets us quite a lot of uh, performance speed up. Okay, so here's uh, how my talk is kind of laid out. Uh, I'm going to start talking about variational bays. I've quite a small audience, so I'm guessing you're fairly specialized. Uh, so maybe we can skip some of these parts. And some people recently have been interested in this idea of collapsed variational bays. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how we do optimization on these collapsed kind of problems, optimization of the approximate posterior. And uh, finally, I'm going to tell you about the tweaks that we can make that make this thing go a bit faster. OK. I have no idea whether this slide is uh, totally trivial to all of you or uh, totally gobbledygook. But maybe you can give me some feedback in a second. So this is, this is kind of the starting point for any Bayesian problem. Uh, and I've colored it according to whether things are sort of tractable or not. So we start with some likelihood, P of D given H, uh, some prior, P of H, and we can manipulate them as much as we want. We can evaluate them wherever we want. But what we can't do is integrate them. Uh, so we can't integrate them to get either the posterior, which I've kind of pink, pinky red, because it's kind of not tractable, or this normalizer here. Uh, I think that's fairly straightforward for everybody. Right, good. So here's a really straightforward derivation of how we get to the variational base. Just swap the two pink bits over, and then introduce this thing Q of H, which is going to be our approximation to the posterior for H. H is for hidden. I thought that was fairly sensible. And, uh, and then take the log of both sides and split it out like this. It's a fairly straightforward sort of procedure. And then say, OK, now I can just take the expectation on both sides uh, under Q of H. So the left-hand side isn't random in H, so it doesn't change. And we end up with this thing here, which is pretty much the expression we need to do variational Bayes. Uh, so we have this uh, model evidence on the left, which is equal to this thing L, which we hope we can evaluate, and this thing KL between Q of H and the posterior, which we can't evaluate. But we know that it's positive, so L lower bound the, the model evidence. Is that okay? Good. Uh, variational Bayes kind of suffers from a bit of a, an identity crisis because there are lots of other approximate inference methods that you might also call variational Bayes. But uh, when I say variational Bayes, at least for today, this is kind of what I'm talking about. And you may notice that this thing that I've cut a blue at the bottom here, this L, which is going to serve as our objective, uh, isn't necessarily tractable. But it might be tractable if there is some kind of factorization in Q of H. This is the sort of general procedure for what we're doing. We say H consists of two sets of variables, which I'm calling X and Z. And what people generally do is they have some kind of factorized posterior Q of X and Q of Z. There may be further factorizations inside them, but that's fairly irrelevant. And uh, they get this bound L, and then we go away and we have this procedure for optimizing Q of H. 
and this bound on the model evidence, which is serving as our objective in the optimization, I'm going to call LMF for today, L mean field for today, because it depends on this uh, mean field approximation. Nothing new so far. So whilst I was looking at various models for doing things like clustering of uh, gene expression data and so on, I came across lots of other literature where people were doing what they were calling collapsed variational inference. And I thought, okay, this seems like a good idea. The general procedure is you take your sort of joint probability, uh, D and H, and you marginalize out some of the variables analytically. So if you've got a mixing model problem, you marginalize out the uh, cluster means and variances and the mixing proportions, and you're just left with these things, uh, the latent variable Z, or you could flick the X and Z around either way. And then you can run some kind of MCMC sampler on this collapsed problem, and hopefully that's better. But what these guys, including Max Welling and co, were doing was saying, okay, let's make it marginalize some things out and then make a variational approximation to what we've got left, to this kind of nasty collapsed uh, distribution. And the problem is, they said, okay, I can't actually do this. I've, by doing this integral in the first place, I lost a lot of the tractability of the problem, and now I can't perform my variational integral properly at all. So I'm going to have to make some kind of approximation, and they made a Taylor expansion approximation. So they took uh, the log of this uh, collapsed distribution and uh, approximated by its Taylor expansion around the mean of Q of, of Z. Anyway, so what they were doing was coming up with an approximation to their objective, which they were then optimizing. And I said, okay, that's not very nice, because now I'm optimizing this thing, and it's no longer a lower bound. I'm just kind of hoping that it approximates something sensible. So I went back, and after quite a while, I came up with this alternative way of looking at similar kind of ideas, which is... Uh, Assume a model looks something like this. We've got two sets of nodes, X and Z. And instead of marginalizing some of them out, take a variational approximation to the conditional probability of the data given some of the variables. So this is just a standard like, variational integral, if you want. So we get rid of Z like this, but we haven't marginalized it out properly. We've just sort of made an approximation to uh, the posterior in Z using Q of Z somehow, but this is still conditioned on X. The cool thing about this kind of uh, variational integration is you haven't broken all of the cool conjugacy that makes the mean field algorithm possible. So now we can get rid of X by just marginalizing. So if L1 here uh, lower bounds P of D given X, then I can show that Take the exponent of both sides, so I've got e to the L1 lower bound P of D given X, and I can just substitute that straight in here, and I've got another bound. This bound also bounds uh, the marginal likelihood, but it only has one variational distribution in it. So when I'm doing my optimization of my, uh, of my variational parameters, I've got a kind of smaller space to optimize over. I'm hoping that's going to be kind of easier. That's my, that's my thinking behind this. There are quite a few problems that arise in a second, but that's kind of where we're going. Is that okay? Yeah. But this is not really the collapsing that was on the previous slide, right? It's not really? It's not the same notion of collapsing that was on the previous slide. Sorry, I can't hear you. The, the collapsing you're doing here is not the same kind of collapsing that was on the previous no, slide. No, it's not. Exactly. That's a really excellent point. Uh, so this kind of collapsing here is potentially much better. So you end up with this joint distribution of, P, of D and Z, and that's quite rich, right? Because it's got a lot of things marginalized out. And then you say, let's make a variational approximation to that. That's great. The problem comes when you have to make this approximation, and then you have to uh, take this Taylor expansion idea. And what everybody is doing is taking a zero or one or two order Taylor expansion around some mean. So it's really only capturing local information. There's another, another thing going on here. 
which I'll come to in a second, but uh, the first order of him disappears. In practice, people spoil the, they spoil it by introducing these other approximations. Exactly. But, but, I, but I'm, my point is just that the notion of collapsing is, di is different, that's all. No. The equations turn out to be exactly the same. Once you make these other crazy... Yes. So this collapsing is but obviously... What, the question is, what does collapse in principle denote? That, that's really, I guess, the, the yeah. question, right? So, so this thing, this type of collapsing is uh, kind of super rich, but you ruin it with the approximation. Yeah, sure. totally. But uh, this type of collapsing, which isn't collapsing at all, uh, is not super rich. You still made this crappy approximation that Q of, where have I got it, Q of Z is totally independent of X. So you've still got the mean field assumption in there. The only thing you've gained over the mean field is that you don't have as many parameters to on this. So I'm not claiming my approximation is any better than mean field. In fact, I'm going to show it's identical in a second. Uh, but I am claiming uh, also that neither is this one. Neither is the true collapse inference because the first order term of the Taylor expansion is zero. The zero order term gives you exactly my approximation. It's fairly straightforward to prove. And I'll talk about that in a second. And the second order term, well, uh, people have only done that for specific models and they do all kinds of horrible things like assume that uh, there's some Gaussianity somehow through some law of large numbers uh, even though it's a discrete variable and actually there was a paper last year that said the best thing to do is just to drop the second order terms it works much better yeah, yeah did you see that? so but I think it's a bit weird the second order terms because I think about these things as uh, just sufficient statistics so second order terms would be pretty critical if your distribution was Gaussian because they would be in the sufficient statistics. But for discrete variables, second order terms seem a bit weird. I don't know. Maybe you have some thoughts on that. OK. So they're not at all the same. But after this approximation, they come out to be identical. So here's one of the cool connections that we've made. Uh, in the... In the mean field variational approximation, there's this procedure where we update one set of variables and then the other set of variables, or we update them in a, in a round robin sort of thing. And it said, uh, set this distribution to be like this. And you get a kind of a message passing, like approach. And in the literature that I've seen, and certainly in the textbooks, it says Q star of X is proportional to these things. And I can tell you that uh, the constant proportionality that was missing is the bound that I've derived, or the exponent of the bound that I've derived. So this thing here looks a bit like Bayes' rule. Uh, here's P of X, there's the prior. Here's something which lower bounds the likelihood, like I showed a couple of slides ago. Here's, so E to the minus KL, maybe I can live on the bottom. This is like a normalizer. It is, after all, a bound on model evidence. And here's some approximation to the steering on this side. It's exactly like Bayes' rule. So this is what happens. So if you take this formula on the bottom here and rejig re a little bit, this, this is what you end up with. And you can see that you could have started with X or Z. So this message passing that goes on in mean field variational base is a bit like sort of uh, fixing the sufficient statistics for some of your variables and then doing Bayesian inference for the rest of them because the graph is now a tree or something you can do inference in. And then fixing that part, and then do Bayesian inference back in the other side. Uh, OK. So here's just a little bit of background on the literature. There's lots of people that have been interested in this. People were doing it years ago. But they've come up with all kinds of weird and wonderful derivations. And I think this is kind of the cleanest one that's going on. And this is why you were talking about a second ago. Uh, this is what we're doing. We're taking. Uh, this is part of the expression. There are other terms in here, but this is kind of the crux of the problem. We take an expectation of a log under Q of Z, exponentiate it, and they get rid of X. Collapse VB are doing it the other way around. Which is, as you pointed out, much richer. But once you make this approximation that uh, you have to bring uh, this Q inside, using a Taylor expansion, the two end up being exactly the same. And then we talk about second order terms as well. 
In second order terms, may or may not help very much. That's kind of open question. I'd like some discussion on that. Uh, here's my summary of what's happening with the, my approximation. So you can see this collapsed VB problem. We're showing you that kind of equivalence. You can see it as this uh, uh, idea of doing exact Bayesian influence in half the graph at a time and then just fixing the sufficient statistics on each side. Or this is another really cool result, which is that um, this is exactly the same as doing mean field influence. You can show that the mean field bound can be as good as my bound. Right? The inequality has an equal sign underneath it. And the way you could do that would be to just fiddle around with Q of Z, but whatever you did, always keep Q of X updated. So whenever you move Q of Z, before you did anything else, you immediately updated the, other, the rest of the variables. That has some uh, pretty important ramifications I'll talk about in a second. Uh, right, is there any more questions? Okay, so the next thing is uh, we've lost something really important here, which is we've lost this cool procedure for optimizing our mean field approach, which said do this procedure on these nodes, and this procedure on these nodes, and this procedure on these nodes, and you always increase the bound. Because now we've only got one set of variants. We've only got one set of a, a variational distribution to deal with. So how are we going to optimize them? So what other people are doing is saying, uh, well, we'll just sort of parameterize it in some freeform way, and then throw it into some kind of... Uh, optimizer. Empirically, I've shown that this works really, really badly for reasons that I'll elaborate on in a second. The other thing you could do is say, well, there's some remaining factorization inside these nodes that I am explicitly parameterizing. So there's some remaining uh, factorization inside Z, so that maybe they're the latent variables in a mixture model problem, and I could update them in a round-robin kind of procedure. But that's the dumbest thing I can think of, because you're going to do expensive and ex as expensive a computation for a single latent variable as you were for the mean field approach for all of the variables. So you just made your thing way, way harder. So then uh, this friend of mine, Antti Honkala, wrote this paper where he said uh, that he could do VB and using uh, Riemann gradients. I'll talk about those a bit more in a second, and they're a fairly integral part of the puzzle here. And these things that we're going to compute, these gradients, are really straightforward if we've already got the mean field problem. So we've already got some code that does the mean field problem. I can give you all the code to do it my way in just a couple of lines because of this property. So the VBEM algorithm, this procedure where you update one of the nodes at a time, is actually a steepest descent method. It's a coordinate-wise steepest descent method. And this was shown for some small models in 2001. And uh, it's kind of the crux of the work by Dave Bly and Matt Hoffman and Ian Paisley at the moment on stochastic variational inference. People have come across that. These updates, you can see them as message passing things, but you can also just see them as steps in a gradient direction. Uh, the derivation is kind of horrible. The paper in 2001 by this guy, uh, Masaaki Sato, uh, is like six pages long, just full of lines and lines of equations. It's totally impenetrable. But uh, if you try it for any model that you, uh, that you care about, you'll see that it's true. And the cool thing is, the gradients of the bound that I'm proposing are closely related to the gradients of the mean field bound, like this. So I'll not go through the math too much, but we're basically interested in the derivative of the bound with respect to the parameters of theta z, and that's given uh, by this expression here for the mean field bound. It depends on what Q of x is commonly set to. And the derivatives of my bound are kind of identical, but after you've updated Q of x in the mean field setting, if that makes sense. And you can do something similar for the curvature, but in the curvature, some extra terms pop up. And the whole thing can be summarized pretty much by this. 
by this graph which says, uh, here's the bound that I'm using. Here's the mean field bound where I'm assuming that theta x, so the parameters of the other distribution that I'm sort of collapsed out, are fixed. And at some point they meet like that. At some point they're equivalent. And they're equivalent after you've updated theta z. And at that point, not only are they equivalent, but the, uh, the gradients are equivalent as well. So if I want to get the gradients of my thing, all I need to do is look at the gradients of the mean field thing. And somebody else has already shown that the mean field update procedure is a gradient method. So if I've got the mean field update procedure, the procedure, I've got the gradients, which means I've also got the gradients of my thing working backwards. Bit of a logical step there, but it works. I can also show some properties about the curvature bound as well. This basically is a requirement for uh, my bound to always be higher than the mean field bound. Okay. Is that okay? So do you guys know anything about information geometry? No? A little bit? Uh, no. Okay. So, I'll give like my 30-second uh, undergraduate level walkthrough, which just makes it totally clear for me. Not too much maths involved. But, but optimizing these distributions, right? And then think about your distribution being uh, a Gaussian with a mean and a variance. And you've got to optimize the mean and variance of this Gaussian. So I did have a really cool demo on my laptop, but it, uh, it died just as I started to set it up here. So I'll just draw it on the board. But think about this. Here's the mean of my Gaussian, and here's uh, the variance. Take two distributions, one's here and one's here. And then say, well, uh, so this distribution has a mean over, he a mean over here and uh, it's kind of narrow. And this distribution has a mean over here and it's kind of wider. But the point is, what does this line mean? But the line means nothing at all. The line is totally meaningless. Or in other words, if I'm here and I want to make a gradient move in that direction, then that's kind of dumb because I could have just done this. And let's have uh, the mean here and log 1 over sigma squared here. And I've got some other parameterization. Now, taking unit steps or taking a gradient step in this parameter space is not the same as taking a gradient step in this parameter space. Is that kind of clear? So this idea of Euclidean distances between two points or moving along a line, which is what we do when we optimize in a parameter space, is really dumb. So what do we do? Well, we say, well, we kind of have some intuition about what we should do with distributions. People spend a lot of time looking at uh, divergences between distributions. If you take your metric of interest as how we measure the distance between two distributions as a KL divergence, we end up with a Riemann manifold of distributions whose curvature is defined by the Fisher information. That all sounds really technical. Uh, and I've put down my pointer. But what it means in practice is we've got some reasonable way of describing how far apart two distributions are, We're totally independent of how you've parameterized them. And what we'd like to do is optimize somehow sort of using that information. Uh, so there was this guy, and he still works in Japan, his name is Sunichi Amari, and he's written this other totally impenetrable tome about information geometry. And the key result is, if you've got a gradient in one of these parameter spaces, and you want to move along it, the direction you should move in is not given by the gradient. It's given by some linear transform of the gradient. And the linear transform is just the inverse Fisher information. Uh, so here's some things about the information geometry that you're not particularly interested in. This is the key. So you've got uh, the derivative of your objective with respect to some parameters. And 
This thing that's equal to the natural gradient or the direction you should move in is given by the inverse of this Fisher matrix, which is totally dependent on Q of, of, uh, of Z, the things that you're, this distribution you're optimizing. Uh, and all we do is multiply them together. That's the direction you should move in. And there's this really nice result for the exponential family, which is uh, all to do with the way it's parameterized. I'm going to give you a little bit of background here. Hopefully you're thinking, oh crap, now every time I need to uh, move in my optimizer, I need to revert a matrix. Well, that's not very nice at all. And the neat result is you can get rid of that inverse through the properties of the exponential family. So if you have an exponential family distribution, which is, I'm sure you're aware, anything like a Gaussian or a Poisson or uh, most of the distributions we're familiar with, there are two parameterizations, the uh, canonical parameterization and the expectation parameterization, which have this property, which is that g of theta is equal to the derivative of one parameterization with respect to the other, which means we can just plug in the chain rule and get the natural gradient in eta is given by the gradient in theta. Or, alternatively, the natural gradient in theta is given by the gradient in eta. Okay, well that's kind of nice. So now I can avoid my Fisher inverse, but there's another cool connection here. The mean field algorithm is doing this already. The mean field algorithm is giving us a unit step in this natural gradient direction. That's uh, what these guys were proving a little while ago, but the cool thing is the mean field algorithm is already sort of circumventing this inverse G of theta. Okay, that's kind of the end of my rambling about connections in variational ways. Uh, so what do we do to make this faster? What do we do? What did, what did I implement to, to get some cool results? Uh, so I took a couple of models and I worked out what this bound would be, and I worked out how to work out this uh, this step, and you can do it using the mean field equations and converting them, or you can just do it directly. But if I just took unit steps in the natural gradient direction, I've just shown that just turn backwards, I guess, that I would end up with the mean field algorithm again. So that would be pretty stupid. So the tiny tweak that I made was just, uh, let's just do conjugate optimization. So here I mean conjugate uh, in the parameter space. So geometrically conjugate as against distribution conjugate. It's a bit confusing if you use both of those words to mean two, as far as I know, unrelated things. Uh, but in most optimizers, uh, Every time it does a little line search or it takes some steps, it changes the direction slightly according to the previous search direction. I'm sure most people are familiar with that idea. And you have to compute this uh, conjugate variable which says, uh, how much of the previous search direction should I include in my current search direction? And so there's some nasty things to do there. You have to compute some inner products on your remote manifold. And Antti Honkolo, the guy who was doing this originally, showed me how to do this. It's fairly straightforward, and it's really, really cheap. It's just, uh, it just turns out to be an inner product. No matrix inverse is required. So here's, uh, here's the first result that my algorithm spat out. This is a, a mixture of Gaussians. And we've got five kind of blobs here. The black outline is showing us the, the sort of outline of the density. And this is uh, VBEM. This is the mean field update method. And each box shows us one, uh, one step of the algorithm, updating all of the nodes once. And this is our method from exactly the same initial condition. This is a, totally a typical run. I've not pulled this out, I swear. From the same initial condition, the first step is identical because we've got no conjugacy. And the first step is exactly the same. The second step, not too different, but just after a couple of steps, you can see that what we're doing is taking kind of bigger steps on our bound. Because this thing is collapsed, we can take bigger steps because we don't have to worry about updating the other variables before we climb back up again. 
Maybe that's not too clear. But I think it's pretty clear that you know, one step in my algorithm quickly starts getting you more uh, pleasant solutions than steps of the VB algorithm. So this thing actually converges a few iterations further along. So here's some numerical evidence. Uh, so I thought a little bit about how can I show people that this thing is better? I mean, they, they sometimes the two algorithms converge to different solutions because uh, there are kind of local minima in the problem. So what I tried to evaluate was if I was to use my algorithm, how many iterations would I expect to use to find what I think is the global optimum? So I counted, I ran the, uh, the optimizers, the VBEM, the mean field update things, and my things for 500 random restarts using the same sets of restarts for each. And then uh, I counted the total number of iterations taken to convergence for each thing and divided by the number of times that I found the best solution that I knew about or came very close to the best solution that I know about. And the results are a little bit surprising. So what's happening here is I've got the problem I showed you on the previous page, which somebody else devised, so I copied, where we've got this mixture of Gaussian's problem with various separation of the, of the data. So for R is 1, they're pretty much overlapping. For R is 5, they're really wide apart. And this is the expected number of iterations over these 500 restarts. And for VBEM, sometimes it just doesn't find as good a solution of any of the restarts as we can find using our conjugate method, which is really surprising. I'll talk about that in a second. But in general, uh, on these three first lines of various slight tweaks on our algorithm, different conjugacy calculations. In general, we're kind of, uh, kind of significantly faster, generally, for this problem. So we looked into why VBM wasn't finding such good solutions. Because we're using the same convergence criteria, we can compute, using our knowledge of the, the Riemann manifold, we can compute the, the true gradient length. Uh, so the length of the gradient vector on this manifold. It's fairly straightforward. We can use that as a convergence criteria. We can use the change in the bound as a convergence criteria. We can use the change in some of the parameters as a convergence criteria. No matter how you look at it, our, uh, our algorithm is finding better solutions. And we think what's happening is there are plateaus in the objective surface. Because we know that VBEM, the mean field procedure, is a steepest descent algorithm, if it finds somewhere that's a bit flat, it's just going to stop. It was because we've got this conjugacy part in our algorithm, we find somewhere that's flat, we'll just keep adding in parts of the previous update until we come out of the plateau and hopefully find that we can rise up a little bit later. Uh, next thing. Okay, so I took all of the papers from the 2011 NIPS conference and around latent Dirichlet allocation exactly the same kind of thing. And this time we've got about a tenfold kind of speed up. Uh, so this is one of our algorithms. It uh, takes about 38 minutes to do it. VBM takes about 370 minutes. These might seem like big times, but this is probably because my Python implementation is uh, sucking up quite a lot of my computational power. Uh, but the two things are you know, approximately equivalent apart from this tiny computation of the, the conjugateness. Uh, this is what the typical graph looks like. This is time on the x-axis and uh, uh, the objective function on the y-axis. You can see it optimizes much faster. And uh, by the time the uh, our algorithms have converged, there's still a fair few nuts off with the EVM method. Uh, okay, any questions? Before I wrap up? Yeah. Did you restart your Fletcher Reeves occasionally? Sorry, I can't hear you again. I'm did did you call. restart your Fletcher Reeves occasionally? Did you restart your yeah. Fletcher Reeves occasionally? Yes, I did. Sorry. I, uh, so these, these things kind of come with a, a thing that says you should restart as often as the number of... I'm not very good at optimization, right? Yeah. 
but yeah, I use some kind of heuristical tricks. I use some kind of heuristical tricks that are fairly standard. Uh, like restart the computation of beta every so often. Uh, sometimes beta goes negative. Know anything about that? If it goes negative, so I'm, I just say, okay, make it zero. Uh, for some reason, the Pollack Rubier one, which is, seems to be the most popular one in the literature, that just doesn't work sometimes. But I think it's because of the weirdness of computing on this manifold. Also, you need to compute, okay. you need to compute exact line searches, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, most of these methods, are, some of them, require an exact line search to have been done, right? Uh, okay. Whereas others don't. So, so, the, so, so you may see a difference if you haven't done an exact line search. Another exact. An exact line search. I'm not quite sure what you mean. Like, are are you doing an exact line search when you after you find your search direction? Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, no. Okay, so we tried that a little bit. Line search is a bit weird on these manifolds, right? There are two, two particularly weird things. Uh, first is that the mean field algorithm takes a step of length one. I don't know why, but that's what it does. It takes one of these, these, uh, these steps of length exactly one. So that's kind of what I did as well. I fixed the step length to one. I seem to work. So then I thought, okay, let's do a line search. Uh, and let's use like, standard wolf conditions. Now, it's a bit confusing you have to compute the wolf conditions on this manifold because lengths are real weird. So to compute the length on a manifold, you have to take into account the, the official information metric. So just to compute the wolf conditions, I had to do a fair bit of thinking about, about how I would do it, and I had to really look in. If you just consider the wolf conditions in the uh, in the parameter space, forgetting the manifold for a second, just in the space of the parameters, then they seem to be satisfied reasonably well with step length of one all the time. Uh, and yeah, I know. So normally you do it, this conscious thing should only really work if you found the minimum along that direction, so that you can so that you, right. I know, it's weird, isn't it? So there's a strong, I have a strong feeling that what's happening is the fact that it's conjugate isn't really helping. But the fact that you're taking bigger steps is. So if I go back to uh, this picture, this is just a schematic, right? But uh, if I'm here and I want to move on the mean field bound, I want to do the mean field update, I know I'll find the optimum conditioned on the other variables being fixed. But because my thing is kind of less curved, it falls away more slowly. Maybe I can actually take a bigger step on my thing than I could have done on the mean field bound. So one thing that I haven't tried yet is just taking the mean field update, applying it to my thing, and just multiplying by 1.1 and seeing if that works just as well. Because maybe the conjugacy is just, is just making some there. No? My guess is it'll work okay for the first few iterations, and then you better go back to one. Okay. It'll diverge, but yeah. others may have better guesses. So as I say, I'm not, I would never claim to be any kind of expert in optimization. I would love to be, but it all eludes me a little bit. Uh, yeah, I understand I need to do a line search, but this thing sort of heuristically seems to work disturbingly well. Uh, which seems to be the, the case in optimization, right? The, even these uh, computations for the conjugacy are kind of approximations to what would happen if we had a quadratic. And yeah, so kind of fudging it a bit seems to be the key in optimization. Okay, I'll wrap up. Uh, so why should we do VB like this? Well, I think my derivation was pretty straightforward. The way I showed you, that you take the variation approximation and then marginalize. I didn't do any Taylor expansions or anything. I've got a proper lower bound on the marginal likelihood, which we didn't have with the other collapsed VB case. So hopefully optimizing does something sensible, or at least it will converge. Uh, the expressions are simpler than VBEM. So you can obtain this bound by taking the VBEM uh, 
uh, bound on the likelihood of substituting one of the update equations back in, and you find the whole of the stuff just cancels out. So actually to compute the bound is less computationally expensive. There are just less terms in the equation. Uh, yeah, if you just did steepest descent in this method, then you would get uh, VBEM back. It's really easy to work out if I've got existing code that does the mean field algorithm. How do I uh, how do I use it to work out the gradients in my algorithm? That's pretty cool. Uh, we looked at it for doing uh, large scale priors as well, so uh, non parametric models. That worked pretty well, and of course. The real reason we're doing this is performance. It just seems to work about 10 times faster for lots of moderately difficult problems. The additional overhead of computing the conjugate, uh, the conjugate number in the optimization is tiny compared with the cost of the update. So it really adds no overhead at all. Okay. Why not? Why shouldn't I do it like this? Well, if you really want to do a properly collapsed problem, this isn't collapse at all. This isn't giving you the nice, rich posterior that a collapse problem could give you. But then neither is anybody else's first order approximation. Uh, and we never achieved our original goal. So what we were really looking for was how do we scale this thing up to be bigger? Uh, and you can see fairly straightforwardly by the similarities to the mean field approach, the scales in exactly the same way as the mean field approach. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions. Yeah. Um, I know this is dumb, but maybe you've thought about it. Um, you've got a little matrix, G of theta inverse. Um, G, the uh, Fisher information matrix. Yes, yeah. which is where the uh, Hessian Yes, well spotted that man. If he were doing a Newton method, that's exactly where the Hessian would go. Isn't that weird? Uh, there's another thing to notice here, which is... Okay, I'll come to that point in a second. Let me just sort my ideas out for a second. It's not the Hessian, though. It's not the curve to the objective. And we don't have to compute it or invert it, is the other thing. Because we kind of get rounder using these tricks. That's kind of neat. Uh, it's only going to work, those tricks for getting around it are only going to work in the exponential family because of the, because of the derivation that I showed you. The next part of the, of the problem is that that G of theta that we're using is the true Fisher information for the mean field bound. But actually, it's not quite the right Fisher information for R bound. Uh, this takes a bit of thought, and I haven't explored it very far, but uh, if you take our parameterization of the problem as just being parameterized by one set of the variables, you say, okay, I'm always going to update the other set, no matter what I'm doing. So every time I move this one, I move this one kind of in parallel. Then uh, there's kind of more information attached to that original set of variables than the mean field approach would let you believe. So the second distribution isn't totally, really totally independent as you move these variables around. It moves along with you. So this is kind of these extra terms that you should really add in to that fish information that arrives from that kind of effect. Maybe that's not very clear unless you're totally absorbed in the, the problem like I am. Yeah. Uh, do you have any idea? Uh, any other connections between kind of the Newton method and what's going on here? I mean, uh, the obvious next thing is it quasi Newton. Is it the is it the J transpose J of something? And there's a hint that there might be because you talked about two parameterizations, sort of canonical and natural or something. Uh, um, yeah. So if you write down, what are they for a Gaussian? So. <laughs> Uh, the short answer to your question is, uh, for a Gaussian, they are, think about this, they are uh, sigma inverse times mu and minus half sigma inverse. 
these are the these are theta. So, and the other one is uh, mu and mu mu transpose plus sigma. These are eta. That's the short answer. <coughs> so you want to move this in the direction of the gradient in this, and this in the direction of the gradient in this. And the slightly longer answer is they in any exponential distribution. They are, however, you write like this. So uh, p of x is equal to So they appear in this form, in the exponential form, theta appears like that. And eta is equal to the expected value of t of x. Boy, so it's, this, this relationship is probably familiar, that uh, these are the expected statistics of the Gaussian. Uh, this parameterization is pretty weird, but that's, that's kind of what pop pops out in that form. Okay? Okay, is there, um, are there any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, then let's thank James again. And James will be uh, here till 4.30 or 4 o'clock when he has to catch his train. So.